this is why Ramadan is amazing. Ramadan actually highlights to you who you are. Because again, the environment is created. And you just need to be honest with yourself. This is something, be honest with yourself, be honest with Allah. And you figure out who you are. So you have a bigger goal. It cannot just be just to get the certificate at the end. Mm -hmm. If that is the goal, then perhaps you'll get it. But what are you going to do at the end? You're just going to roam around your city for a while and say, I remember when I sat there and studied. And I remember when I did this. And it'll be just memories rather than something that is built upon. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Firmly Rooted. We're back with a very special episode actually because this is the Ramadan special episode. And Ramadan, it's the month where we try and better ourselves, increase our habits, increase ourselves spiritually. But at the same time, we hear some very common lessons that kind of and problems from um, the way that we think about Ramadan. Um, doing too many things, too many habits, doing too much, not being consistent and falling off by the end of Ramadan. We've all heard it before in probably the last khutbah that you attended. But today is not just about saying those things. It's about thinking how can we actually practically think about forming these habits from Ramadan and practically, tangibly thinking in the right way so that when we get into Ramadan, um, we're thinking about our habits and the way that we structure our lives so that it's consistent with kind of after Ramadan for the rest of the year. And with us, because it's a very special episode, we have a very special guest, Ustad Muhammad. Who are you? Tell us who you are and what is this episode about? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Firstly, Zakhla khair for having me on the podcast. And I am following the giants. So I appreciate being here, but uh, know that I'm following the giants. Uh, I am Muhammad Al Kiani. I teach roots in Sheffield. I used to be, this is my uh, f claim to fame. I was a partner of Hisham in Nottingham when we taught there as well for a while, alhamdulillah. Um, I've been part of roots from early days and I'm also part of the academic team, alhamdulillah, working on the curriculum that we teach at the universities. Very exciting. Well, Jazakallah khair for being on Ustad Mahal. Um, so let's get straight into it um, and discuss, first of all, before going into the details of um, you know, how should we look at Ramadan and the habits and what's too much and how do we be, stay consistent and all these different things that uh, the audience wants to hear about. Let's first of all start with the basics, which is what is Ramadan all about? Okay, it's a wonderful question. And everyone has an answer for this question. Everyone should have an answer because Ramadan is an anticipated month. And we all have that feeling at the end that we wish it was a little bit longer or we wish we did something extra. And the reason you have that desire is because you already recognize that there's something special about the month of Ramadan. So I want to frame Ramadan the way you would frame like a holiday package. And I want to show you that we have the golden package, or in fact, the jubilee or the diamond, or whichever one's the most elite to you. And Allah has actually laid it out for us. And it's our choice now to accept the package, put the full investment in, or we can sit back and relax and be the ones who lose out on it and we get the uh, the stories, the Instagram shares by everybody else who made the most of this package. So the way I like to look at it is Ramadan is a collection of five things. The first thing is, is repentance. Because we know that if you leave Ramadan without repentance, this is a dangerous place to be in. But Allah created a package that it's not just normal repentance like you would have every day in the third of the night or in your sujood or anybody who does tawbah in the year, repentance of any form. It is a different type. The hadith says, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانْ إِمَانًا وَحْتِسَابًا We have a fast month of Ramadan with certainty and with anticipation of reward, their sins are forgiven. If you can't fast every day of the month of Ramadan and you're struggling with that, there's another one. Man qama Ramadan, iman al Whoever stands praying in the night of Ramadan, and we do this in Taraweeh prayer, with certainty and anticipation of reward, they are forgiven. If you can't do that, Man qama laylatul qadri, iman al Whoever stands on the night of decree, with iman, with certainty and anticipation of reward, they are forgiven. This is not the usual package of repentance. This is a special one for Ramadan. Then the second thing that you have on offer is Allah is going to give people a free pass and protection from the fire. There are so many ahadith that, that some of them would n relate that every day that you fast, you move away 70 years. Another one at the time of iftar, people's names are written that they will not touch the fire. This is a special package that is again set for you. The third one is 
the reward in Ramadan is unlike anywhere else. We have in other hadith again that rewards are multiplied. So you could work for an hour but get the reward of 700. This is generally speaking. But in Ramadan, Allah says, As-Sawmuli, that fasting is for me and I will reward accordingly. But then the fourth one is actually Ramadan is setting us up for happiness. Which is, you don't normally look at Ramadan as just setting up for happiness. But there is a hadith that the Prophet says that for so the sorry. fasting person, there are two joys. The first one is when you break your fast. And of course, we all have our iftars together, enjoy our meals. And we see the gloomy faces before the food goes in and that joy that comes after. And if you really want to see this, either look at the youngsters. See how happy they get when they fulfill the day of fast. Or look at the elders who really have valued what Ramadan looks like to them. And then the, the joy in the hereafter as well, when you see the reward. But all of this is actually summarized in the fifth part of the package. Where this is actually a conversation I had with my dad recently. And he mentioned that Allah, he owns everything. And part of Allah's creation is time, is space, is the angels, is all of these things. And we'd all know how it feels when you pray Isha in the masjid on a normal day. And you pray Tarawih in the masjid on, let's say, the first Ramadan. You don't need to put the heatings on in the mosque. Because of the people there, you see the change in the environment. What Allah is doing for us in Ramadan is actually changing the environment, manipulating it for us. And Allah has done this before. With the people of the cave, Allah protected them while they were sleeping there from Surah Al-Kaf. For 300 plus years, Allah protected them, the sun didn't touch them, nobody would see them. They would be twisting and turning while they were sleeping and this was all protection for them. Allah has done this with Maryam alayhi salam when she gave birth and Allah told her to shake the tree, the palm tree. She would not have the energy to cause the dates to fall but Allah, He did what Allah can do and cause that the dates will fall then we know the famous hadith of the one who who killed a hundred and he sought forgiveness and he travelled to a different land and he died on the way and he didn't reach that destination and he was closer to his the place that he left from and when the angels of mercy and angel punishment went to Allah, Allah said measure the land and we understand from the hadith that Allah, He manipulated the land to make him closer to the place that he was he was going to so we can see Allah can change the environment Allah sets us in the month of Ramadan with an entirely changed environment. The package is everything is set for your heart. You have the multiplication of reward, you have the repentance, you have the protection from the fire, you have all of these things that are set up for you. Allah is setting up for your heart. Allah is locking away the shayateen, opening the doors of heaven, closing the doors of hellfire, sending down the angels and you will be in the environment like you feel the heat increasing with lots of people around you you feel the blessings increasing in the month of Ramadan. Now the question is, Allah has created this package for you, what are you going to do with it? Wow, wow. So just to quickly summarize of course. all of that, yeah. um, kind of those nuggets essentially. Um, we all think of Ramadan as that month that we can actually change and become the ideal Muslim really. Yes. And what you're proposing is the reason that that's the case is because Everything is set up perfectly for that to occur. It's not just a cliche that Ramadan mm. has the ability to change. It is truth. And the reason for that is, like you said, it's the time for repentance um, and a special type of repentance. Mm. It's a time where you're protected from the fire. It's a time where your deeds are multiplied. It's a time where the environment is most kind of perfect for you to actually change and um, kind of do the things that you want to do um, for the sake of Allah and then the, the final one was to okay, firstly I'm impressed I'm impressed that you remember I'm really listening no, I'm, I'm really kidding. listening and the fifth one was Ramadan is um, a time for happiness Absolutely. and joy which is yes. something that isn't really that you typically think of with Ramadan you think Ramadan is time for work it's yes. time to it's time to transform but I, I don't know a single Muslim who's not so happy during Ramadan mm. and so sad when Ramadan ends. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. I just want to really quickly interrupt this podcast with a very important reminder. As Ramadan approaches, we invite you to join us on the Roots Academy mission. Our mission at Roots is to address a problem which is affecting 170,000 Muslim students across UK campuses. One in four of these students are slowly drifting away from Islam due to the overwhelming pressures of godless university and an underwhelming amount of structured, relevant Islamic education. 
we talk of strengthening our ummah through our future generation, be that through pursuing higher education or respectable careers. But how will this strengthen us as an ummah if the roots of Islam are forgotten? Our purpose at Roots is to enable students to live God-centered lives. We are the first and only educational provider aiming to transform student lives and in turn the future of the summer. This is primarily through our structured on-campus essentials course which aims to provide foundational knowledge to students. 22 sites, 1500 hours of teaching, 41 instructors and 58 volunteers. We are only scratching the surface of what's possible but we need your help to fulfill the full potential of this mission. Roots Academy is a not-for-profit volunteer-driven organization whose success has ultimately been driven by the will of Allah and your generous donations. We want to use the money to expand to 35 university campuses, develop further modules and further experiences like the Roots Umrah. Please, go to the link in the description, donate to Roots, invest in our future, one student at a time. Anyway, back to the podcast. It's a whole machine to allow you it's a whole transformation machine mm. essentially Absolutely. um and now the question is um and i think that's a question that you're alluding to there at the end which is what do we do with that machine who do we want to transform into and i'll repose the question back to you which is what does the ideal muslim look like and to be more specific to the audience because it is university students or students in general watching this yeah what should a university student be aspiring to look like um, and in turn what should Ramadan do for them in terms of transformation? Okay, this, this is a question that we need to ask ourselves regularly in our life. This is a self-assessment that we have to do and we need the people to actually ask us this question as well. So even when you're asking me, I actually need to ask myself before we share this, this conversation with everybody else. And it needs to be a thought. Ramadan actually becomes like an instigation to ask yourself the question, not necessarily just what am I going to do in Ramadan, but how can I be the best Muslim? Allah has created an environment for me. I need to use this environment so I can prepare for the rest of the year. And when the next Ramadan comes, I need to become a more of an ideal Muslim. Now, there's no one single answer to say that this is an ideal Muslim. Because in everybody's life, what is ideal is very, very different. And what we need to do is actually look at the ones who we consider to be ideal. You have the prophets, so, so. you have all of the prophets that came and the stories that we know, and we have the companions, and we have the righteous of the past, and you actually have an ideal Muslim probably in your household, in your masjid, in your friend group. There will be one around you. All you really need to do in the beginning is actually find out what their life was like. This is, this is the real uh, investigation that you need to do. Find out what their life was like and actually find one that you relate to the most. There'll be a companion who's very shy and didn't want to be in public. There'll be another one who loves hosting podcasts and asks all the questions. There were, there were companions who used to knock on the door of the Prophet Sallam, wait outside, so, so. just to ask him the next question. And we love them for that. Because if they didn't, then we wouldn't know the same answer to the question that I'm going to ask you or somebody's going to ask me. There were the others who were busy in trade, but they wanted to make sure that they're doing it in the way that Allah, Allah loves. There were the others who loved worship. There were those who loved being in service to other people. You find your characteristic and then find a companion that matches your characteristic. We already know they're the ideal ones because at the end of the day, where your success lies is not just what you see in this world, it's what's waiting for us in the hereafter. Yeah. Look at their life and actually they will give you the blueprint of what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So if, if a companion doesn't like to be in the public eye that much, what does he do in his life to still maintain him being in a position or her being in a position where Allah says, I am pleased with them? Mm -hmm. They've done something and we know a lot about their life. And use that and then build on it yourself. Yeah. So I want you to refute probably a, a common, a common not argument, but probably something that some people are thinking in their head, okay. which is, yes, I understand. Okay. And the prophets, they're, they're, they're the best example. Yes. But really, they're not like me. Okay. I'm a student. Okay. I have to study. I have mm. to work. I've got other things in my life that I have to balance. That, that just doesn't seem like what the prophet's life were like. Is that correct? Is that incorrect? And what's your response? Okay, firstly, I don't do refutations. <laughs> this, this is just a conversation. <laughs> no, you know what I, I mean understand, that. of course. <laughs> See, uh, Allah actually made the prophets as examples for us and made them and the companions as examples for us 
so that we don't have that question because they weren't angels who don't they have the human needs they have the the happiness the sadness they have the difficulties have the responsibilities all of these things they have them in their life so the first paradigm shift that needs to take place is actually yes they are like me now they didn't study in the university like i did but they still went through some studies they still had a teacher let's say the prophet sallallahu he had allah and jibril alayhi salam as his teacher how is their relationship break it down to what is applicable to you so you have a family relationship that you need to fulfill as an ideal Muslim as well. Mm -hmm. Look at how they were interacting with their families. And don't say that, yes, they were the best of behaving people and so on. This is true. But there's some quality that they showed that I can show as well. So if there was a time where they showed firmness, there's a time that I can show firmness. If there's a time they showed compassion and mercy and f uh, forgetfulness or, or forgiveness and so on, there's a time that I can show that. But you look at the scenario, not necessarily always just a method. Mm -hmm. As an ideal Muslim, there's two things that we would find in all of the lives that are fulfilled. A relationship with Allah and a relationship with the people. And they both need to be taken care of. So the ideal Muslim has a relationship with Allah, fulfilling the obligations, making the dua, reciting the Quran, doing all of these things, surrounding yourself with good people. This is a relationship with Allah that's being fulfilled. Then you have the relationship with the people. And this is very, very important. Almost just as important as your relationship with Allah. Because there are so many times where Allah prioritizes the rights of the people over the rights of Allah. An example, let's say Ramadan. If I am unwell, I'm not allowed to fast. I shouldn't be fasting. Although it's a right of Allah that I fulfill the obligation of fasting. Allah is saying, no, prioritize yourself at this stage. If I'm traveling, again, prioritize yourself at this stage. And there, even equally, if I owe somebody some money and I wanted to go for hajj. Hajj is an obligation that is a relationship with Allah. I should prioritize the needs of that person because they might need the money, you know, there could be their needs that I need to fulfill. Allah is telling me, prioritize their needs over Allah's. So in your life, the people are very, very important. Mm -hmm. So the ideal Muslim is somebody who's good to their family, is good to their friends, is good to the stranger, is good in their spare time, is good in their busy time, is good at university, is good with their studies, is good with their, with their own time management, is good with all of these relationships, good with their food, good with their health, good with all of these relationships, and you need to break them down. You look at it, you look at your life and say, okay, I have this relationship with Allah. I have these few things that I would do regularly. Alhamdulillah, of course, always improving on them. Yeah. But when, when it comes to the people, I do need to make a list. Who are the people in my life that I have a relationship with? And who are, what are the things in my life that I have a relationship with? It could be sports. Mm -hmm. I have a relationship with sports. And as a Muslim, you, sh you should give it its due right if you want to invest in it, invest in it properly. And it doesn't mean that you need to become an expert. It just means when it's time that I prioritize for my, for my health or for my exercise or for my sports, I prioritize that without compromising on other things. So I'll fulfill that duty and then I'll fulfill the next one and the next one and the next one. The ideal Muslim looks at every aspect of their life as... A gift from Allah And I need to fulfill the gift In the best way possible Yeah Wow And I think you re you've, I, I was thinking of this concept In my head Before the podcast And I just couldn't Find the right words to, in, in terms of that balance But I think you framed it Really nicely mm. In terms of You've got the rights of Allah And you've got the rights Of the people and, Yeah um, we, we kind of understand What the rights of Allah means Yes uh, In terms of the rights Of the people I think it's sometimes Hard to understand What that actually mm. Um, includes, but you 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 explain that really nicely. It's not just what it says on the tin, the rights of you know your family and your friends. It's yeah. it's also the rights that you have um, you know onto yourself in terms of your health. It's also the the rights of kind of your career and um, your studies and university because in the long term that directly affects your relationship with people. And Absolutely. Um, if you're if you're studying a particular subject, like for example medicine, then that is a rights of the people and um, and another discussion for another time but if you then reframe that into you're doing it for the sake of Allah yeah. then it transfers into the rights of Allah as well yes so e even if you look at the like the motivating factor for a student studying medicine engineering business or uh, sometimes people do the arts as well the law <laughs> all of these things whatever you are studying the motivating factor is not actually your mind you can sit there and study every day and listen in your lecture and so on. The motivating factor is actually your heart. And w our heart does not survive unless it has that relationship with Allah. And whatever you're doing with the people, you're recognizing Allah as part of that process. Mm -hmm. 
So even if you're studying something, if I am not motivated to say, let's say you have a career in mind. If you don't have a clear path that you want to follow, the heart is not going to motivate you to do something while you're at university. Mm. You'd rather hang out with your friends and have a good time because the heart is not leaning towards something in that direction. Even if it was to to make the family proud, make them happy, if it was you had a like if, if you wanted to become a, a doctor or something, or and you, the obligation was not just I want a good career and have good money at the end, but I also want to be useful to the people. This becomes like a motivating factor for you, and the heart then instructs the mind focus. If you don't have that. Then the heart cannot instruct the mind, mm. and where does the heart get its its nourishment and so on? It is in your relationship with Allah, and then naturally, it goes into your relationship with the people. Yeah, Star, you should have been on the careers podcast. You'd have no. been perfect. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, we've kind of formed that backdrop yes. to the things that you need to be thinking about and trying to perfect and to become that quote ideal Muslim student or ideal Muslim. Um, but let's talk a bit more tangible now. Okay. Okay. We've got these two things, these two things that we need to to think about, which is the relationship with Allah and the relationship with the people. And now my question is, how can we tangibly make sure that those things are balanced? Okay. So that we're not neglecting either one, because each one is so vast, yeah. and you can easily get lost in either one. So, practically speaking, how how can we Take something away from this episode and think. Okay, okay, I, I've formed a, a system to to think about how I want to prioritize each one and give the due rights to each one. Okay, so, you know, I I would actually say that the question of balance is beautifully explained to us in Surah Rahman. So this is a surah that actually tells us to be grateful. Which are the favors of Allah? Will you deny? But Allah also mentions early on in in the surah. That Allah has made al-mizan, He has made like a scale, and Allah has balanced everything. If you look at all the few ayat before and majority of the ayat after, Allah starts talking about all the nature around you. You know, we talked about the environment earlier. Allah talks about the nature around you. He talks about the the sun and the moon and the ocean and the pearls and in the ocean and the ships that are floating up top, the trees and the stars. Allah talks about all of these things to highlight to us Allah has made everything in balance. Now you need to be in balance. Everything else, like Ramadan, the environment is created for you. Allah has created the world environment for us. I don't need to worry about the ground shaking underneath me, especially here in the UK. Alhamdulillah, we've been we've been safe. We don't need to worry about things because Allah has created everything in balance for me. Now the question is, what am I going to do to make sure that I stay in balance? There's a lot of things in in the Sunnah that make it very clear to us what we can do, balancing between relationship with Allah and with the people. I'll actually start with gratitude Where if you're grateful to Allah You cannot fully be grateful to Allah Unless you're grateful to the people This becomes a full picture of Balance, your relationship with Allah And with the people You also have good thoughts about Allah You cannot have good thoughts with Allah And have evil thoughts about people They have to come in one package So if you find that you are always second guessing somebody else Or second guessing your relationship you have with someone Or even your relationship with Allah you need to monitor the two and see how is my relationship with Allah? Do I have good thoughts and recognize who Allah is and what He can do for me and how Allah is taking care of all of my affairs and so on? If I recognize that, I can then see the good in everybody else. This is why you can find that the Prophet it doesn't matter if a Bedouin is coming to him shouting on the top, like top of his voice, uh, saying, Muhammad, come out, I have a question for you. It doesn't matter if that's happening or if it is Abu Bakr and Umar and coming gently and having a gentle conversation. The Prophet ﷺ is always having good thoughts about them because he has the best thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did the Prophet ﷺ become the best of all character? One of the key reasons is because he can make an excuse for somebody else in the best possible ways. And we need to do the same. Yeah. But equally, the balance is in terms of what is your goal? If you don't have a goal with Allah and a goal with the people, you cannot strike a balance. If, even if I wake up in the day and I have my five daily prayers, but I don't factor in there's time to eat, there's time to visit family, there's time to study. If I don't factor in these things, I'll not balance my day. I'll get lost somewhere. Maybe I'll pray late for one of the prayers because something else came up. Maybe I'll forget to call my mother when I was meant to today. All of these things will come into play because I didn't actually have a goal. I didn't set myself up for something. With all of these relationships, you need to have a goal with them. So with Allah, what is the goal? And 
there's a few things that are very obvious what is our relationship with Allah but equally for everything else as well if you want to become an ideal Muslim you need to have a clear path with mom and dad you need to have a clear path with brother and sister you have a clear path with, with your friends and this is not to say that now my friendship is on paper and there's a goal this is to make you productive to somebody else around you because you do want to be the person in the hadith of the Prophet says that when your brother is struggling with something and you put your arm around them and you walk with them until their problem is resolved you want to be that brother to somebody you can't be that brother to somebody when you're all over the place somebody else ends up being the brother to you <laughs> rather than the other way around the ideal Muslim is in service to other people and if you don't know what service I can offer, who am I in this particular realm, in my friend group? Am I the one who will be the Quran reciter? Or am I the one who will be the food server? Or am I? There are different roles that you can fulfill, and each of them make you an ideal Muslim. But you need a goal with every single element of your life that will strike your balance. Yeah, yeah. You phrased that last bit very interestingly because you mentioned you need to have a goal. Hmm. But then you were talking about these goals as though they're identities that actually you need to fulfill, yeah. which is very interesting. I, I like how you put it, you put it better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that you need these goals, but actually it sounded like, okay, are you going to be that Quran reciter? Are you going to be that brother? It's as though not a goal, but a role. Yes, um, it is what you're. Sure. You're just getting the quotes in. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all from you. It's all from you. Um, you've got the knowledge. I'm just. <laughs> I, I want to start no, no, noting these down. This would be like the next quote. <laughs> <laughs> um, but is that what you're trying to get out here? Is that what the transformation actually looks like? Rather than okay, I want to read this much Quran, uh, or I want to. Um, do um, I want to memorize this much, or I want to pray this amount, um, or I want to X, Y, Z? So those sound like goals mm. in, in in like the purest form of the English word. Yeah, this is a goal. But I think, and it kind of links to consistency, doesn't it? It's when you adopt it as an identity is when it truly becomes consistent. Absolutely, absolutely. This is why Ramadan is amazing. Ramadan actually highlights to you who you are. Because again, the environment is created And you just need to be honest with yourself This is something, be honest with yourself, be honest with Allah And you figure out who you are In Ramadan you have the opportunity to be with the community And you also have the opportunity to be on your own And you need to take both of these opportunities Ramadan is not fulfilled If you haven't had that one One of your goals in Ramadan needs to be I need to have a private moment between me and Allah yeah. But one of your goals also needs to be I need to, I'm going to be in the kitchen and my family can relax, I'm cooking the meals for, for tonight mm. This needs to be part of your goals that you're setting But why are you setting these goals? One, to please Allah, to get the reward, all of these things But also to kind of figure out who you are And yes, Ramadan takes us out of our comfort zone We're used to eating We're used to sleeping at certain times We're used to doing things in a certain consistency that Ramadan does not allow Is re rechanging the atmosphere for you And you need to step out a little bit further to recognize who you are to find your character yeah. Because the companions They became the friends of Allah The close, the ones who Allah said I am pleased with them The ones who are we recognize as the elite after the prophets They became this not by all of them being the same It was rather all of them recognizing their identity And fulfilling their role in their identity In the best possible way yeah. They'll be the warrior And they'll do that to their perfection And they'll get that, that role Mm -hmm. They'll be the one who is the reciter of the Qur'an And they compiled it and so on And they get that role They'll be the one who is buying wells left, right and center Uthman mm -hmm. They'll be the one who is taking care of particular groups of people Like uh, maybe the ill Maybe the orphans Maybe the ones who are visitors Compared to the residents They will take up these different roles And they become the best at them yeah. And yes, sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would so push them in a direction Like Bilal radiallahu anh, He was given the role of being the Mu'adhin The caller of, of, of Adhan for prayer But he wasn't the only one There was also a blind companion Who you might think, what is his role going to be in society? But the Prophet ﷺ, first of all, this companion, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum He has a few verses that were revealed in relation to him so this was an honor that Allah gave him But also the Prophet ﷺ recognized that there's good qualities in every person And they can fulfill it by recognizing who they are yeah. So one of the duties he had, he was the Mu'adhin When Bilal wasn't around, 
he was making the adhan in the masjid of the Prophet <clears throat> So the key thing really is, is to figure out who you are and shape your goals around you, mm-hmm. not around somebody else. This is not a comparison. Even when we talk about the companions, you're not comparing yourself to them. You're actually learning from them to apply to yourself. Yeah. Use their context and apply to your context. Hmm. So it sounds like the very first step yeah. is deep reflection. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who you are and more importantly, who do you want to become? Yes. And now let's try and make it even more tangible so that we kind of can see what it would look like, mm. you know, as, as a day to day in Ramadan as a student. Yeah. Let's give an example of someone that you might, might want to become. For me specifically, I'm, I'm really trying to make an effort to uh, memorize more Quran. Okay. It's not something that um, I've um, ever really put proper effort to in life. And at the moment, I've, I've, I've got quite a small goal of just trying to memorize Juz Umma. Um, so, okay. I want to stop you there a little bit. The, I'm interrogating you now inshallah. Okay <laughs> Interrogation <Yeah. starts. laughs> So you have a goal of memorizing yes. Juz Amma Yes Question Why? I think the biggest thing is To feel more connected in prayer Okay yeah. So now the heart is not motivated by memorizing It's motivated by the prayer mm-hmm. And you need to shape this picture for yourself now Why is it I want to be more focused in prayer? Because this mm-hmm. is a time where nobody else is around me. It's just me and Allah. I'm having this conversation. Mm-hmm. The brother next to me with great perfume or smelly breath, doesn't matter. I'm praying between me and Allah. Yeah. And I want this relationship to be one that carries on when I said, Salaam alaikum wa Salaam alaikum wa I don't want it to just be there. Mm-hmm. And I need something that takes me to the next level from what I already have. Yeah. This is what's motivating you to memorize. And now you've got this goal to memorize and perhaps you've had it for a while. Yeah. What has been the thing that hasn't allowed you to to fulfill that goal? Okay, so the the questions that you were always going to ask me. (laughs) So, I think the biggest barrier has always been an imbalance between a focus on the people and the focus on Allah, uh, priorities on Allah. Um, I'm I'm a nerd, like I'm very studious. Um, Mashallah. um, Mashallah. And um, I, I often, when exams come by, I think all other kind of habits focus on to okay me doing well in exams, um, and even though I I have exams twice a year, because it is it takes up so much time. Any habits that I did have become inconsistent during that time, and then I have to kind of restart building those habits. And I think that's always been the biggest barrier. Um, and actually, I I I realized that when I when I started this Quran journey recently. Um, because at the moment I, I, I calculated, okay, how long do I have till my next exams? Because I know that even if I try and mitigate how much effect that's going to have, it's going to have an effect. It's going to be a barrier. And I thought in my head, okay, I have three months and one week till my exams. 100 <laughs> days, I, I calculated. Yeah. And I thought in my head, okay, if I can memorize just on mine two months, let's say, that will mean that I can... I can Prepare for that month of more intense revision and you could say um, rights of the people in, in that sense um, I can Then rebalance so that now I'm just maintaining just on my yeah. Rather than memorizing more and that way I won't feel overwhelmed I won't feel kind of anxious and drop everything altogether, which okay. often happens. So that's hopefully inshallah going to work Okay, um, but that's kind of the barrier that I've always felt and this time round me trying to really reflect on how I can stop that barrier from being a problem. Okay, so I'd say this is a common barrier. Even with, with other things, sometimes we have a desire to travel. Yeah. But I need to fulfill my studies, I need to make sure that the family is taken care of once the students start working, rent and so on, all of this kind of comes into play and travel becomes like a distant memory. Unless it's that one one time a year that you take a holiday, but if you if you can break it down and treat a journey to to Manchester as as your holiday, mentally treat it as your holiday. Enjoy your time, eat the food, meet the people, see the one mountain and tree that's here. But enjoy your time and treat it like a holiday. What happens is that the same thing that you desired of an outcome is fulfilled for you, mm-hmm. and the same thing needs to apply needs to be applied here too. See, when, when I was younger, 
I never had a day off with memorizing Quran. Maybe the weekends, but never really had a day off with memorizing Quran. We'd go every day after school to the masjid between Asr and Maghrib. And even when it's exam season, same thing would apply. And one of the key things that were motivating was we know that if you do something for Allah, not being neglectful or just being wishful or so on, but something for Allah, sacrifice a little bit of time, Allah will place blessings in the rest of your time. Yeah. You make it intentional. Yeah. And the other thing is, our teachers became our motivation. My parents would always tell me that uh, there came a stage where you were sick and we were like, you want to relax today? I said, no, no, I want to go. The motivation was actually the teacher because perhaps I didn't want to let them down. I wanted to make them happy. I loved being around them. They always made me feel better. That did not just come from them alone. It actually came from the Quran. Yeah. Because I wasn't there to ask them what did they eat today and what time did they wake up and what team do they support. That wasn't the conversation. It was genuinely just about the Quran. Yeah. And if Quran is the goal and memorizing is the goal, make this now as a blueprint. You mentioned consistency before. We know the Prophet says that the Sallallahu best, Sallallahu. most beloved actions to Allah are the consistent ones, even if they are smaller in number. Yeah. The habit building is actually built around this concept. Your relationship with Quran is not the memorizing of Juzamma. It is the regular moments that I spend with the Quran. That's what the Quran actually wants to come and spend time with you. And you know when you spend more time with it, the Quran is more giving. Mm. You'll find that uh, you'll just be walking in the street and the Quran, remi- the, in the heart, it reminds you, just recite an ayah. Why, why is this? Ha- of course, Allah is doing this and your consistency with it and so on. But what happens? And then you recite the ayah. And let's say, this has happened to me. Make a mistake. Right? And then I check on the phone. What was the ayah? Once I've corrected it, I actually feel so happy. Yeah. I feel a sense of relief. Yeah. I feel a sense of comfort. And it, just, it was just a random ayah. I wasn't reciting like a whole page or anything or an entire surah. It was just, just one ayah. It just came to my mind, made a mistake, checked it. I become happy. All I did to build that moment was my consistency with it. So even now you've got 100 days. It's good. You know, the, the idea of building a smart goal. And you break it down, make it make it tangible, make it very accessible to you. This is very important. But the key thing really is, is to make it consistent. Now, if you set a goal of two months and you're consistent with it, you have a certain amount that you memorize, you get through it. Let's say you don't finish it in two months. You haven't failed on your goal. The goal is still there to complete Juz Amma, that 30th Juz. Mm. Your assessment at two months is, have I maintained my relationship with the Quran? Yeah. If you haven't, then the way you are going about to achieve your goal was is what needs to be changed. Yeah. Maybe you need to combine memorizing with understanding. That you 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 know you learn about the surah, know what it's talking about, and so on. Even if you're just reading the translation, make your own notes, do your reflection. If I could give a plug to our Quran course, the whole objective of that course is to make Quran accessible to you. That you are, everyone has the duty of reflecting on the Quran. If your objective, even in, in Ramadan. You'll have the goal of, I want to recite this many times, I want to do this, I want to dedicate this time. Amazing. But in Ramadan, if you do not have a separate goal that says, there's a certain surah in the Quran that I just love listening to, mm. but I need to take it to the next level. Yeah. I, need, I need that to be in my heart when I need it. So I'm going to embark on a greater study in that surah. I'm going to read the interpretations. I'm going to do my own reflections. I'm going to start asking questions. This takes now that relationship with that surah to the next level. Yeah. That if you leave that period of time that you spent with that surah, you actually gain so much more than if you memorize that surah. Of course, there's a lot of reward with memorizing. It benefits you in the long term, inclu- improves your memory. You All of these things happen without a shadow of a doubt. But if you really spend a moment with it, you know the, the, the hadith of the one who recites every ayah, with every ayah they elevate in paradise. They'll be asked, the, the one who's a reciter of the Quran will be asked to recite and they will elevate. What do you think of the person who perhaps didn't memorize the Quran, but had a few of the ayahs in the Quran that became their guide in their life, that became their constant, that they kept going back to? Maybe they struggled to memorize it. Memorizing wasn't easy for them. Mm. Allah is merciful. If this was an ayah that they lived by, we anticipate that they will recite this ayah to elevate as well. Yeah. This needs to be applied to all of your goals now. That you are aiming for a smart goal, something that's you have a timeline, you have make sure it's tangible, reachable, you have a bigger goal, the bigger goal is always Jannah, that's always in the background. All of this is, is, is existing with you, but you need to make it very, very accessible. So, if you had the goal of, of Quran, we've broken that down a little bit. If you had the goal of maintaining your fard, your obligations, 
So getting your five daily prayers, your fast, and one day when you're in a position to give zakah and go for hajj and all these things, you are setting yourself up for those moments. How are you going to achieve those goals? Number one, know who you are. If you're a person who loves to delay things all the time, this is the first thing that you need to work on. And that, that you would know that in general life. If I'm the one who always arrives five minutes late to a dinner, to a football game, to an ice hockey event, then I know that I like to kind of push things a little bit. The first thing I need to work on is that habit. With the intention that I want to apply this to my prayer. With the intention that I want to apply it to something else. And equally, so Ramadan comes around and your goals will be around these obligations. But they'll also be around things that you want to leave Ramadan is not complete unless there's certain things that you want to leave out of your life. Number one, you need to highlight what they are. Number two, know your your relationship or, or what your character is. And then number three, how are you going to make this tangible? You need to break it down. Yeah. Look at consistency. Ask the people around you. How did the people before used to deal with this? Because you weren't the first one mm. to have this, this, this difficulty, this trouble in your life. How do they deal with it? How can I break it down for myself in my life? And then write it down. Yeah. Very, very important Write it down Don't need to post it anywhere Just write it down Between you and yourself mm-hmm. And if you do need to Sometimes it doesn't help Telling a friend That I'm I'm on a mission To memorize Jiz Amma And they should keep coming to you And asking you Where did you get This is a great Motivating factor Maybe even make a competition mm-hmm. Between you and We have Rayan here Have yeah. a competition <laughs> If you, if you can that That's a motivating factor mm-hmm. But the heart is what You would really be setting Your goals Your consistency on Your efforts on Your excellence on And so on Yeah so lots and lots of advice there for everyone, but a lot specifically for me as well. So Jazakallah well, Khair. Um, just to summarize that, because there was so much um, yeah. kind of nuggets there. Um, you going to give me those one-liners now? No, <laughs> I was not planning on those one-liners. They just came out. <laughs> Usually I'm not very good with one-liners the very first time. Um, but um, it sounds like, for example, w- with me, that memorizing just on my, that is a goal. And it's nice to have, you know, that goal to look forward to, but really that isn't the true goal. Yeah. Um, and it never really should be. Um, and rather it's more about, okay, who do I become through going through this journey? Um, and inshallah, through this, if it's, if it's to memorize Quran, you should want to become through this journey someone that understands the Quran more, has a stronger relationship with Allah, someone who's consistently... Um, looking and reading the Quran on, on a daily basis Those are really the true goals Or maybe actually the rewards You could say The goal maybe is to memorize This amount of the Quran But truly you should be focusing on the rewards Which is what you become through yeah. Trying to go through that so, journey So th- there's a goal and then there's the essence of the goal Yeah, The goal will be the things that you write down mm-hmm. The things that you set And the things that's on your daily to-do list and so on yeah. But then there's an essence behind it What is the true motivating factor mm-hmm. And and you can't make a goal without the motivating factor Yeah, yeah, yeah And, and would you say that applies to not just um, Kind of the rights of Allah But also the rights of the people And what yes. does that look like? Absolutely So even between you and, and a parent Yeah uh, the goal is to to make them happy. This is like a motivating factor. Mm-hmm. And that is bolstered with all the rewards that are associated with it and so on. But then the more tangible goal that you will set is um, I tell them about my whereabouts if I am traveling. Mm-hmm. I ask them to make dua for me. I bring them some gifts. I pick up a leaf from outside and bring it home and say, Mom, this one's for you. Yeah. These these would be like the tangible things that you will do to fulfill the the essence of the goal which is to make them pleased, to make your relationship good, to attain the rewards, to get all of these things. Yeah. The goal is not that they then give you something. The goal is that you do something and Allah gives you the rest. Yeah. The same thing applies to your studies too. So you have a bigger goal. It cannot just be just to get the certificate at the end. Mm-hmm. If that is the goal, then perhaps you'll get it, but what are you going to do at the end? You're just going to roam around your city for a while and say, I remember when I sat there and studied, and I remember when I did this. And It'll be just memories rather than something that is built upon. And even if you're in the middle of your study, you can set that goal. Mm-hmm. Whatever you are studying, even if you weren't sure what to start with and so on, once you've started, now set that goal, the essence of the goal. Yeah. So where is it taking you? And then when you have that, then build from there. So that that essence of the of the goal is like somewhat of a vision conversation as well. Mm-hmm. And then build the tangible things. Yeah. So I'm going to wake up early and do some studies in the morning. <clears throat> I'm going to make sure that I only have one night 
or two nights that I spend out with with the friends, with the events yeah. and so on that I would do. And so, why are you doing that? Because you have an essence that you're building on. Yeah, yeah. And I'm visualizing it like a pyramid at the moment um, of of motivation, a pyramid of motivation. Okay. So it sounds like at the bottom of the pyramid you have actions, goals. I want to memorize this much, or I want to buy my mom a rose. On top of that pyramid is the essence of the goal, like you mentioned. I'm doing this because I want to strengthen my relationship with my mother. I want to strengthen my relationship with Allah. Yeah. And then the top of that goal is identity. In order, this essence is going to shape me into this type of person. I want to uphold this identity through this essence. That's what it what it kind of sounds like in in, in my head. Yeah. I like I like the three step process. <laughs> I'm not sure about the pyramid though. The, the reason I mm. say is because I don't want the identity to be the smallest thing. Mm. That's the only reason. But yes, that that is the the, the yeah. process that you or go through. Bricks. Oh, yeah, <laughs> bricks. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, okay, so we've talked a lot there. Um, just to summarize everything we've talked about so far, we mentioned um, kind of Ramadan and the 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 five kind of beautiful things that allow us allow Ramadan to be such an amazing opportunity and then we talked at length about um, really what should we be focusing on and what should we be prioritizing and that distinction between the rights of Allah and the rights of the people and making sure those things are balanced and finally we mentioned and talked about how should we actually think about these goals in a way that makes us truly motivated um, intrinsically rather than extrinsically uh, and if you're intrinsically motivated hopefully inshallah that means that no matter what comes your way in Ramadan or after Ramadan we are still motivated because there's a deeper reason as to why we're doing these things and it sounds like the biggest key there is reflection yes and um, being uh, the most powerful thing that we can do before and during Ramadan so that it can continue on and you know, before this podcast, I wasn't sure what the direction was going to be like. I thought maybe like there'd be lots of practical tips of you know how to um, how to balance this and that, and what time to do this, and uh, maybe you know do do the, this thing in the morning and this thing in the afternoon. But to be fair, with with, with all the episodes so far, it's always taken a much deeper turn, which uh, which I always really really like, uh, which is a testament to to yourself and all the other speakers that we've had on. Um, so. Jazakallah khair, Ustad. Do, do we yeah. have some time? We do have some time, so anything okay. else? Can I... Let me conclude it with a bit of that. Okay. And related to Ramadan. In the ayah of Ramadan, Allah talks about it's the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. But there's a key thing that Allah mentions, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرِ فَلْيَصُمْ Whoever of you witnesses the month, they should then fast. Now there's a jurisprudence fiqh related matter here about who is fasting, who's not fasting, and so on. But there's a key thing that Allah mentioned. He didn't say whoever is there in the month, whoever is present in the month, whoever experiences the month. Allah says whoever witnesses the month. You cannot be fully immersed in something unless you are truly a witness of something. You know, there's a difference between a statement by a witness versus a statement of somebody who watched it on, on video. There, there's disparity between the two. There's a difference between somebody sitting in the front row of a game and seeing the goal go in and seeing who fell and who didn't, who celebrated, who didn't, to the one standing in the back who just jumped because they saw somebody in front of them jumping up and down. Mm. And there's a difference between now somebody sitting in the front row, getting all of the commentary, having all the stats in front of them, knowing the full detail of everything that took place, knowing the number of audiences in there, knowing the health of each player, knowing all of this, that person has witnessed something different to the one who might be next to them. The month of Ramadan needs to be a month that we witness. And how does that happen? It's actually through what you were mentioning. It is waking up in the morning, intentionally, making sure you're ready for some suhoor, making sure you're having the early morning meal, trying your best not to sleep after fajr, getting your sunnahs of fajr because they are the most valuable ones in the day. After fajr, some Quran, because Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has placed barakah in the early hours for, his, for our ummah. And honestly, it does wonders for you. I have done things in the morning hour. No, I'm not talking about dhikr. Genuinely just doing work, studies and so on. I've done things in that hour that would have taken me an entire, a full nighter. And Allah gives you that focus. Allah gives you 
the distance from distractions and so on. So if you can utilize that, especially in Ramadan, and then make it a habit of afterwards, that should also be a time where you go in airplane mode. Where I'm just going to spend some time and focus. And not all of us have the ability to sit down for an hour, like yourself, and put your head down and do everything. You might need 10 minutes, and then 5 minutes of doing something. And we, as fidgety people, we do need to do something. I, honestly, if you're going to do your, your studies in the morning, that 5 minutes should not be scrolling through an Islamic reminder. It should be giving yourself an Islamic reminder. And you can change your relationship with Quran that morning by just saying in those five minutes, I'm going to recite two ayahs or three ayahs. And then I'm going to go back to my study. Because you can't snack on anything at that time anymore because you're fasting. You're building that habit. And you will sacrifice your sleep in the month of Ramadan to build other habits and prioritize your habits too. So if the morning is a habit that you really want to prioritize, then sacrifice your sleep a little bit Prioritize that for not Ramadan For after Ramadan And then you can rest and go to your classes And do everything that you need to do If Ramadan becomes too much and you need to rest a little bit more And there are some, some lessons that are sometimes recorded You don't always have to be in, in the class But make sure you are actually watching them And taking notes and, and studying properly And then in the evening before Maghrib time You kind of need to give yourself uh, A moment of pause Look back at your day What, what have I done? And don't start your day by the time you woke up in the morning. It actually started by yesterday's iftar that you just had. What have I done since then to, to right now? Yeah. Because I'm going to fuel the dua I'm going to make when I'm about to break my fast. If I didn't do too well, I need to make a dua Allah tomorrow, make it better than yesterday. This is again actually building a habit of reflection, as we spoke about. Mm. Then you break your fast, ideally with your family, if you're students, with your friends. I think this Ramadan you have an Easter break as well. So utilize that, be with the community, be with those around you. Don't just break your fast on your own if you can. This would be an ideal, it's a great environment to create around yourself. And then you have the evening, you have the, the Isha prayer, you have Taraweeh prayer. Again, pray to what you are able to do. Make it a prayer that is not prioritized over your obligations. Your obligations need to be prioritized. And I would also say save some for yourself. So don't just make every single night your prayer is with the community in the masjid, with behind the imam and so on. Save some for yourself. Even if there are two rakahs. If it's in the beginning part of Ramadan, if it's consistent throughout, ideally, if it's something that you work towards, save some for yourself. And the objective of that is actually to ask Allah that question, Allah, I want to understand myself. I want to make this Ramadan the best. I want to take something out with me. I want the, like the, on the Eid when you get gifts, I want that gift to be something that Allah has given me because of what I did in Ramadan. Make those, those tangible things. And don't lose the people in the day. So you need to be mindful that there might be somebody, if, you, if you're living at home, perhaps your parents are cooking food for you. You need to be very mindful that they are doing this. Yeah. And I need to just go in the kitchen, smile a little bit, boil the kettle, walk out, do something. You need to be in service to the people. Equally, you'll be hungry. You'll be angry. You'll be hangry. You might be in that position, but what are you going to do? You're going to recognize that this is, this is where I am, and I'm not alone with this. The people around me are feeling the same. I'm going to build on the relationship with them, with the relationship of Allah, mindfully. So if the opportunity comes and dates are being handed around, I'm not going to be the one who grabs them all and puts them in my pocket. I'll take one because I need to break my fast, but I'll pass it on and make sure that everybody else has one. These are like very simple things that you would do, but this needs to be the transformation that, that Ramadan gives you that then becomes the life habits that you take because witness Ramadan today so that on the Day of Judgment, you can witness the rewards that were just piling up. And so when you witness something that is amazing, you want to shout it from the rooftops. Tell everybody in the world, in Jannah, you will do that. Witness everything else in your life as well. Because you want to be in that position where you stand on the Day of Judgment to see the rewards one over the other and so that you can shout about it when you're in Jannah to everybody else. Yeah. Astad Muhammad, Jazakallah Khair for all the Likewise. wisdom. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. And uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaamu Alaikum.